Good morning. As we start our gathering today, I want to read for us from Psalm 113. Read from a book of songs before we sing. This is one of the things that the people of God sang when they gathered. Psalm 113, first four verses, says, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Those words, those thoughts, those truths weren't and aren't filler, not religious language because that's what we do. Those are truths that we proclaim about God and to God as we gather and as we sing. So as we lift our voices this morning, we are doing so because He is great and His glory is over all things. Servants of heaven, all creation, praise the name of the Lord, night and morning, sing his glory now and forevermore. The king comes, all now before him, praise the name of Who? Mm-hmm. 
Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me, when my sins have all been torn, in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It will never be the sure and steady anchor when the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though I justly stand accused I will hold fast to the shall never be removed. We're going to sing that verse again. As we do, commit to Him. Cast your cares on Him. Christ the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on. When temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won, deeper still than yes. the though I justly stand accused, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Thank you, Father. Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul now, lift your eye to Calvary. This my power. sure and steady anchor as we face the waves of death when these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath we will cross God. 
riches I need, O oh, man's empty praise, Thou mine inheritance, Thou and always, Thou and Thou only, first in my high King of heaven, my treasure. High King, High King of my victory one. Heart of my own heart, heart of my own heart, whatever be for, still be my nation, oh, Please pray with me. Father, we have sung some glorious truths about you this morning. Lord, I thank you that you are the ruler of all. Thank you, Lord, from everything to the intricacies of the universe, to the kings and the things going on in this world to our very lives. You are our sovereign king. And as we sang about, Lord, you are faithful. So I want to pray this morning, Father, particularly for those of us who, who may be struggling with fear. I know there's some, Lord, you know that are facing surgeries, that are dealing with ongoing health challenges, that have question marks about the futures of their jobs. But Lord, help us all this morning to re be reminded in the depths of our souls that you are ruler of all. You are faithful. And even as the psalmist wrote, Lord, because of who you are, our great shepherd, even when we walk through those valleys, as he described, the valley of the shadow of death, we do not need to fear. For he says, I, as your word says, because you are with us. As we sang, Lord, thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Thank you. We have the deep assurance, those circumstances may try to tell us otherwise, that our Father in heaven and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will never leave us or forsake us, and will be with us through every moment in this life and on to eternity. So thank you for these glorious truths of your word. Bless the remainder of this time together for Jesus' glory, I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I had the privilege of briefly meeting some visitors this morning. And if you are visiting with us, thank you for being here for taking that step of coming and, and participating in our service this morning. And I hope myself and others can get to know you better. And I pray you're already being encouraged in our God. Well, this morning, I have just a couple very special and exciting announcements, specifically on the progress toward ordination for both Josh Payne and Jeff Nickel. Woohoo! Yes. So rest assured, this will be a lengthy announcement, but it'll be the only announcement. And I'm going to just say it now and say it later. For other announcements, go to the big enough email, okay, and read them. So first of all, for the sake who may be, for the sake of those who may be new to our church, 
as a part of Sovereign Grace Churches, one of our shared values is that local churches are governed by local elders. In our denomination's Book of Church Order, which all Sovereign Grace Churches have agreed to follow, we have a robust, rigorous process for the ordination of elders in our local churches. In keeping with the Scriptures, the local elders are responsible to affirm a man's calling and sufficient gifting to serve, but also to evaluate his qualifications to serve according to the Scriptures in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. In addition to evaluating gifting and character, there is a rigorous testing, and I still remember the days when I went through it, there is a rigorous testing of the man's knowledge of the Word and his ability to handle the Word that includes a lot of recommended reading, knowing and being able to defend our statement of faith, writing several doctrinal papers, passing written tests, and then passing an oral exam before our regional ordination committee. The final step before a local church ordains an elder is for our regional elders, in our case the West Region elders, to have a voice in approving this man to be ordained as an elder in our region. So here's the updates, and I'm going to begin with Josh Payne. We shared an update last August in our church family meeting that Josh had completed all his papers and had passed all his written exams. We also asked all of our church members to share with us at that time their affirmation of Josh or any questions and concerns they might have, leaving the window for that through October of last year. And our hope at that time was that Josh would complete the oral exam and then possibly be ordained uh, at the end of last year or early this year. Josh wasn't able to get through the oral exam in time for us to do, use that timetable, but the good news is Josh passed the oral exam in March. Yeah. And, and trust me, quick footnote, you're going to see it actually won't see a video clip on this, but three pastors on the other side of the table testing you, it's an experience, let me tell you. But Josh passed this test in March, and in our recent Regional Assembly of Elders meeting in April, just a few weeks ago, Josh was unanimously approved by the region, giving us their affirmation to move forward with our deigning Josh as an elder in our church. And we're going to show you like about a one-minute video clip, if Deirdre could play that now, a part of that Regional Assembly of Elders affirmation. Just on behalf of, well, I won't, say, I won't throw the other ordination committee members under the bus, but just on uh, Josh, as we looked through and graded all of Josh's stuff and read, uh, I just want to let you all know, if you don't know Josh that well, we're receiving another elder in the region, a guy who's very theologically sharp. I would imagine that Josh, Josh's gifts in terms of his theological acumen and his writing ability, I mean, we just were, we were thoroughly impressed uh, by how Josh was able to not only articulate truth from God's word, theological truth, how well led he is, um, how sharp and articulate he is. Just imagine that that's going to serve us as a region and strengthen us. So just so that you understand you're receiving that as we approve Josh today, we're receiving uh, a gift of a very sharp theological mind. I'm sure um, on top of his just jovialness and joyfulness. His <laughs> gifts uh, as a leader of the Purdue Barrington's Church, but a very sharp theological mind that we're, we're receiving uh, in him as an elder in the region. So just so you guys know that about him. Yeah. Am I back on? And if you couldn't quite catch all those words, Josh has a very sharp theological mind, and he is a gift to our church. So, we don't have a date yet officially set for Josh's ordination service, but as soon as we know, we'll get it on the calendar and let you know. And Josh, where are you? Josh, can you come a little more to the front? Can we just express to Josh our gratitude? There he is. Yeah. 
So, Josh, thank you for all your hard work and not only serving so faithfully in so many ways in our church, but for all the work you've done to pursue ordination. Now, an update on Jeff Nickel. And for those visiting, he was the tall guy playing the guitar right over here. Also in our family meeting last August, we inform you that, that the elders have come to believe that Jeff was ready uh, to be for us to put him forward to formally begin the ordination process as well. Since Jeff is already, already employed by the church as our administrator, we knew it'd be a challenge for him and possibly take longer for him to get through all of the reading, study, papers, and exams. So Jeff has been working through all the recommended reading and is in the process of writing his doctrinal papers. He's scheduled by the way, to take his first written exam this Tuesday. So he's on that, on that track. Jeff's hope and ours is that he would complete all the papers and written exams in time to take the oral exam in October. So we'll keep you updated on his progress. Please be praying for Jeff as he works hard to complete all the Sovereign Grace ordination requirements. So Jeff, where are you? Jeff, come up here too, at least to the middle. Can we also express our gratitude to Jeff for all his hard work? <laughs> so Jeff, thank you for all your hard work, not only as our church administrator, but all the additional work you're doing to pursue ordination. And as I conclude this rather lengthy but important and exciting announcement, I just want to say the preparation and raising up of these men is evidence of God's great kindness, grace, and provision for us. As we've been praying, and I promise no age jokes, but as we've been praying, I guess I just broke my promise, but as we, meaning Pete, Tony, and I, have been praying for the next generation of elders to be put in place for our church. What a blessing from the Lord for us. So please pray for Josh and Jeff as they continue on the path to ordination, that the Lord would encourage them, that the Lord would strengthen them and give them faith for the calling he has upon their lives. Amen? Thank you. So as I said earlier, for the rest of the announcements, read the Big Enough email. Okay, And if you want to get access to that, if you're visiting, have questions, let us know. So now we're going to take our seven-minute break. So we're going to continue in our series through 1 Peter, picking up from where we left off last week in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. We'll be looking primarily at verses 21 through 25. You know, years ago, when I was living... Uh, in, in Canada, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, serving there as a pastor for a number of years, I, I had the opportunity to take a class at Regent Theological Seminary taught by none other than J.I. Packer. Uh, the, he, the course was, or the class was on gospel and culture, and he was retired at this point, so he only taught like one or two classes a year, uh, whatever was on his heart kind of thing. It didn't really matter what the class was. I'd say for myself and about 90% of the people in that class, we were there because this is J.A. Packer. <laughs> and before he dies, we get to actually take a class from him. You know, it was really about that. And I, I did learn a lot uh, in the class. Uh, you know, and it, I, I've read other things that he's written on the topic. But what really what stood out to me about Mr. Packer himself was, was two things. One, he had just turned 80 years old, and yet, although he had a syllabus that we went through, we all got one, and he had it there on a, on a podium, uh, for like two hours, uh, three times a week for this class over the course of the, the semester that this class took, every single time, he almost never looked at that syllabus. He turned the page, and he would just look. And... He was almost continually talking over all of our heads. I mean, it, during the breaks, we would all be talking. There's some other pastors uh, in and around the, the, the lower mainland 
that we lived in there. And we would meet, you know, at the breaks of coffee, and all of us go, wow. Like, I couldn't talk like that now. <laughs> you know, this guy's 80 years old. The second thing, besides just the brilliance of this guy, was that the, the only time he showed emotion, and I, I, I mean, th- this old guy sat here like this, looking at us, just, I mean, he was, looked like he was 100. Uh, I mean, he was 80, so he's doing pretty good, but very frail looking. He, he never hardly broke a smile. He talked in a monotone voice with an English accent, very quiet. You had to really <laughs> lean in and listen. But the only time that he got emotional, and sometimes very emotional, is when he spoke of Christ and the gospel, and especially about his substitutionary atoning death for our sins. There were numbers of times that we were all in tears. In 2007, Crossway Books published a book titled, In My Place Condemned, He Stood, which is mostly a compilation by Mark Dever of essays and chapters from various books written by J.I. Packer on this subject of the atonement. And in the introduction of this book, Packer quotes a fellow theologian on his deathbed and, and says in, in this that this, this is how I feel in this moment. He says, as I grow old, I want to tell everyone who will listen, I am so thankful for the penal substitutionary death of Christ. No hope without it. Now, maybe you're wondering, what is that? I mean, like, substitutionary death of Christ, that, that sounds like a big concept, and it, it is. This dives into the deep waters of the- theology, really, but it's something every Christian should know about. We should understand it, whether you don't remember the names or words, the big words or not, that we understand what's behind them. So friends, do you know about the substitutionary death of Christ for you? Do you know that he stood condemned in your place, that he took the punishment that you and I deserved as he hung on the cross, because that is the essence of substitutionary atonement. Packer's right. There is no hope without this glorious truth. And Peter knows this. The Apostle Peter knew this, which is why he anchors everything that he's been saying to us and instructing us to do in this, in what is the very heart of the gospel. So, let's turn our attention to God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 2, read with me, beginning verse 20. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 21. That's where we're picking it up. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were all you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I'm afraid this glorious truth that, that Peter is presenting to us here at the end of this chapter is sometimes either assumed. Or, or given little thought. And yet, Lord, this is, this is so significant. I pray that you would help every one of us, no matter how familiar this concept or idea might be. Lord, help us to hear this morning from your Spirit through the preaching of your Word. Stir our hearts, Lord. Let faith arise. Let hope arise. Lord, I pray that we would leave here having spent time in this passage, changed by it. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, the, as I've thought about how to summarize this into one concise statement, I, I thought about it this way, that the entire basis, this is not the thought, actually, the summary thought, but the entire basis for our present assurance, our future hope, and the power to live our new life in Christ rests upon the truth we're going to be looking at right now. So here it is, just to sum it up. Jesus Christ stood in our place to bear our sins and the wrath we deserved so that we might live for Him and for His glory as God's holy people. It's a lot in there, I know. It's longer than I'd like a summary statement to be at this point, but there's, there's just so much packed in these few short verses, and it's so important for us that we get it. Jesus Christ stood in our place. He stood in our place to bear our sins and to take all the wrath that we deserved. There's nothing more important for us to get this morning. He did that so that we might live. That we might live for Him, and as Peter says, to righteousness. That we might live for His glory, as we heard earlier, because we are now His holy people. That we might live as His people in this earth. That's why He did it. We're going to look at this in three main points. Number one, we're, we're going to look at his saving example. So it's going to be a bit of an overlap to last week, but we need to catch up from there and then connect it up to where we're at today. And then two, we're going to look at his atoning sacrifice, his atoning sacrifice. And then lastly, his death has brought us new life. His death has brought us new life. See, this, is, this, this sermon this morning and this, this message is not so much about something we must do. Peter's already been given us stuff that we are to do. He's now anchoring all that he's, the commands, the imperatives he gave us in this indicative truth about what Jesus has done for us. And so really what we have to do today is take this in, marvel at it, embrace it and hold fast to it for the rest of our days. That's, that's what this is about. This, this isn't about application. This is just about gazing upon glorious, glorious truth. So we look at my first point, his saving example. As I mentioned, it's going to be a bit of an over, overview, but I think it'll serve to keep all this in context for us because we can't just extract this passage, verse 24 and 25, let's say, out of its context we rob it of the purpose, the meaning that he put it here. So we're going to keep it in there. So kind of going back a little bit, catching us up. As exiles, in fact, in chapter 1, verse 1, he calls us elect exiles. As elect exiles and God's chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that Peter says we are in chapter 2, verse 9, we are to view ourselves, as we heard in verse 11 and 12, we're to view ourselves as sojourners and exiles in this world, seeking to live our life each and every day in such a manner before an unbelieving world that even some of them who might actually be speaking against us might eventually come even to saving faith in Christ and glorify God for how our conduct commended Christ in the gospel. See, our, how we live in this life matters for the gospel and for Jesus' saving purpose in coming to this world. So how we live that out each day matters. That's, that's the main point. Then, as we started looking at two weeks ago in verse 13 to verse 20, Peter began to unpack, in essence, what he meant by the good conduct he had just talked about that we're to be living out before the unbelieving world. And this good conduct that we're supposed to live for the sake of Christ, for Peter, starts with, which is very interesting in itself, he started with our disposition towards and our submission to all human authorities in this life as is appropriate in the varying relationships we find ourselves in. And Peter then goes on, as we looked at last week, to instruct slaves Specifically, to be subject to their masters, he says, with all respect. Not only, he says, to the good and gentle, 
but also to the unjust. And we mentioned last week how in the, this, the context of this passage, it clearly applies to all of us in all the relationships that we find ourselves in where someone's in authority over us. This could be true in any one of our relationships. You don't have to be a slave for it to be true. Because we're to be subject to all authority for the sake of Christ. So that, that doesn't change our disposition towards them and the command for us to submit to them does not change because they're unjust. And we don't like that. And we don't have to like that. But we don't do it because of them. We do it for the sake of the Lord. So with this whole topic, as we looked at it last week, Peter is introducing the topic of Christian suffering unjustly, Christian suffering unjustly for the sake of Christ, which he's going to carry that theme through chapter 3 and into chapter 4. But here he's applying it specifically to how we suffer sometimes under unjust authority in the world. And so what does Peter do? He says, we're actually called to this. That's even more shocking in verse 21 as we started reading again this week. We're we're called to patiently endure unjust suffering, he says, because Christ suffered for us and set forth for us an example. And so we we looked at this a bit last week that, that Jesus, he is being put forward. His suffering is being put forward as an example for us. Uh, so that we might follow in his steps, he says, so that we could patiently endure when we find ourselves suffering unjustly. So there is, that, that is what something Peter's doing. But you might recall this. I, I shared part of this last week from Edmund Clowney. He says, a life of suffering is our calling, not our fate. It's not some indefinite, forever thing that we're to do. But it is our calling here and now in this life. It's our calling, he says, just because we're God's people. It's our calling because it was Christ's calling. He calls his disciples to follow him. So if we're going to follow Christ, we will very likely at some point experience unjust suffering, and therefore we can look to Christ in those times and and know how to act and, and why? But the question that, that we need to raise is, is how could Jesus patiently endure such un, cruel, unjust suffering that he experienced? Touched on this a bit again last week, that, that reviling and what it means. But he, he was uh, spat upon, he was falsely accused, he was cursed at, he was even punched and then flogged by Roman guards. And through all of that, Peter says he did not revile in return. He did not threaten. How could he do that? Well, Peter tells us in verse 23, the way Jesus did this was he was continually entrusting himself to him. And implied here, I believe, is God the Father, him who judges justly. Now, we looked at it as well that he didn't just, it wasn't just entrusting himself but by implication, he's tr- entrusting everything to God, including the circumstances that he found himself in through which he was suffering unjustly, and the people who were actually doing the un- injustice to him. And here's something else I want to add. I believe he was also entrusting to God the Father, you and I, and the very purpose for which he came. Because, there, you know, humanly speaking, there could have been a temptation that, especially when he was being flogged by the Romans, a lot of people, the majority, did not survive flogging to even make it to the cross. Jesus is entrusting everything to God. And so he, he, that's why he could sit there and take it without a word. You see... Here's something important now that we need to pick up on. Jesus was much, much more than an example for us. His example, as Edmund Clowney states, was a saving example. The ultimate reason that Jesus suffered without availing himself of his nature as God incarnate, which he was, 
or even to call down at any point a legion of angels to smite all those who were at that moment abusing him. The reason he didn't say a word or do anything to defend himself or protect himself, he instead patiently endured it, was for love. He had come for a purpose that was established before the foundation of the world, to stand in our place and suffer for us. Had he bailed out at any moment and not made it to the cross, we would have no basis of coming before God. We would still be dead in our sins, without hope and without God in the world. Jesus had to endure it. The writer of Hebrews says he enjoy, endured it for the joy set before him. Paul speaks about that this, what he did, was the demonstration of love. This is how we know that God loves us, because Jesus died for us. I'll touch on that a little bit later. So we should follow his steps, <laughs> and, and like the apostles, Count ourselves blessed to suffer unjustly if, if, if it needs to be so, because Christ suffered unjustly for us. But we must also see and rejoice in the fact that we will never need to suffer in the fullest sense of what, how Jesus had to suffer for us. Peter's not saying we got to go suffer for our sins or someone else's sins. Jesus, his suffering goes way beyond any suffering we will ever know in this life. When we get to verse 22 and 23, Peter presents Jesus, in essence, I would say, as our sinless, suffering Messiah. Now, he isn't just providing us an example to follow or the best motivation for us to endure unjust suffering here and now. What Peter's doing now as we get to verse 22, Four and 25, he's taking us to the very heart of the gospel itself, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. His example was a saving example. We're going to uh, ha- do something a little different this morning as we're focusing on the substitutionary death of Christ from this, these verses, and, and really from verse, I would say, 22 all the way through 25, Peter is clearly reflecting upon Isaiah and the prophecy of Isaiah about the Messiah coming as the suffering servant. Something, by the way, that the leaders of Israel failed to see or really refused to see. They didn't want that kind of Messiah. And so they, they, they didn't assign that text to Jesus, which it clearly, clearly does. Jesus was our sinless Savior. He stood condemned in our place. He took the wrath of God that we deserve. And it wasn't just something that was made up, something that God designed before the foundation of the world that he would do. And Isaiah prophesied about it hundreds of years as though he was an eyewitness of the very event. So we've got three individuals who are going to help us read from Isaiah 52, verse 13, all the way through Isaiah 53. It's a long passage. So I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and come up. Michael can get them set up here on the mic. What I'd like to ask us to do is stand, those who are able physically to do it. We've heard this passage, some of us, many times. But in light of what Peter is saying and the importance of grasping what it is that Jesus has done for us and bearing our sins. Let us pray that God would help us to take this in and and the Spirit of God would be imparting these very words from His, His Word into our hearts. So read with us. It should be up up above and, and listen. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. I'm back. 
Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty uh, that we should look at him, and no beauty that we would desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet... It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen. You guys can be seated. Very sobering, but not only that, Isaiah prophesies this as though he was an eyewitness to the sufferings of Christ. See, Peter would have seen with his own eyes all the suffering that Jesus endured and observed it following exactly along the lines of what Isaiah prophesied. He would have observed the Savior receiving all the reviling that was tossed at him, the threats being sped upon, blows with fists, the flogging. He would have seen and observed that Jesus did not revile or threaten in return. And in fact, he would have observed Jesus going all the way to the cross, through all that suffering, to the cross itself in silence as a lamb led to slaughter. That takes me to my second point, his atoning sacrifice. Now let's unpack this. Jesus bearing our sins, as Peter writes about it, was it a sacrifice of atonement? As Clowney states that Jesus is far more than our example. He is our sin bearer. That's, that's something none of us need or can follow him in. He is our sin bearer. Isaiah says, as we just heard, he bore the sins of many. In fact, he bore the sins of all those who would come to faith in him, past, present, future. But to understand this concept of sin bearing, it, it's not something familiar to us in our culture. Uh, it, we need to go back to the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant. 
and, and understand it from there. We could, we could go back to uh, Leviticus 4, for instance, where the Lord instructed Moses that even unintentional sins needed to be atoned for by the offering of an unblemished bull sacrificed before the Lord. I think even more relevant to us in the passage we're looking at, and as Jesus himself as our substitutionary atoning sacrifice, is Leviticus 16, where Moses instructs Aaron to offer up on behalf of the people, and this afterward this was to be done every year on behalf of the people, offer up two goats. So two goats were to be selected and brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and lots were to be cast to select one of those goats to be sacrificed as a sin offering, and its blood sprinkled inside the veil in, in the most holy place, all over and in front of the mercy seat. Aaron was then to lay his hands on the live goat and confess, as he laid his hands on it, to confess over it all the iniquities and sins of God's people, so that then the live goat would be released into the wilderness, representing that our sins, the sins of the people of God, have been cast out, removed, and cast away from them. Likewise, we could look to the time of the deliverance of the people of Israel out of Egypt. The last and final plague before God delivered them, he was going to kill the firstborn of every household throughout Egypt. And before the angel of the death would come over that entire land, he instructed that all the people of Israel were to each take an unblemished lamb and kill that lamb and spread some of the blood of that lamb over the, the door and over the, uh, the doorpost, around the door of their home. They were then to cook that lamb and eat it inside and wait. And what was going to happen is that the angel of death would pass over every house that had the blood over it. John the Baptist, maybe having all this in mind, but as a prophet himself, in John 1, verse 29, proclaims this over Jesus as he, he approaches him. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Earlier in Peter's uh, the epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter declared that we've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ then he adds, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus, or in the writer of Hebrews, speaking of the once for all sacrifice of Christ, says this in verse uh, 12 of chapter 9. He says, he entered once for all into the holy places, the very holiest place where God dwelled in the temple. Not by means of the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption, that, and that redemption for us. And then a, a bit later in verse 26, he says, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is you know, appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once, to bear the sins of many will appear a second time. Jesus, we sang about earlier, he's coming again. Not to deal with sin, because he's already dealt with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. He himself, Peter says, bore our sins in his body on the tree. The tree is just another way of, of saying the cross. That's how the, the Jews understood. They looked at the cross, and in the Old Testament, anyone who was hung on a cross was accursed. And so Jesus took the curse for us. He was hung on a cross. The, the Pharisees thought by doing that and, and a curse, having him cursed by being hung on a tree on this cross, that no one would want to follow him. Because they, they didn't understand that the Messiah came to, as a suffering servant to be a substitutionary, sacrificial, atoning death. To be a lamb slain for us. Peter wants us to see this is no abstract Christian doctrine. 
And we should never, ever look at it this way. Because he says here, he himself, Jesus himself, not some angel, not some other person. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body physically. This was very personal for him. He experienced it all in himself, in his body. No one else could have done this but the sinless, holy Lamb of God, who was, in fact, without blemish. He fulfilled all that the Old Testament sacrifices were looking forward to, because back in the Old Testament, it also says, you know, the blood of bulls and goats can't actually atone. Those were done by faith, looking forward to the once-for-all sacrifice that is Christ Jesus. There's now, therefore, no need for any further sacrifice Because Jesus has offered up once for all himself in our place. Friends, this means what Peter's saying here, that every one of my sins and of your sins, the sins of every one of his people, past, present, and future, this is mind-blowing, were placed on Jesus as he hung on the cross to be a sacrifice of atonement for our sins. The way Paul talks about it, similar to how Peter puts it, but in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, Paul puts it this way. He says, for our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Peter says the same thing. He was sinless. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Theologians call this the great exchange. He got our sin. He got the punishment we deserved. We got the reward he deserved. We got the righteousness that he alone was worthy of, that he earned. That's why it's often called the righteousness of Christ has been credited to us. No other human being earned it. He did. And he laid it aside and instead took our sin, all the filth of it, all the guilt was on him. Isaiah, as he prophesied, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, as we heard in verse 4 of Isaiah 53. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. Who put it there? Who put our sins on Jesus, friends? Who killed him and crushed him in our place? Sorry. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3. Beginning verse 23, he says... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, every one of us, and are justified by, and I think you could assert only by, His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, listen, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Implied here, it's God the Father who put Him forward. Or as John says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave. He, came, God, he sent him forth to do. To be a propitiation by his blood. Now that's another big word. You may not remember the word or be able to repeat it again. But I pray you'll be able to grasp what it means and hold fast to it. Because it has everything to do with the substitutionary atoning death of Christ in our place. Here's what uh, Jay Packer said about it. He, and there's, there's another word he's going to throw at you here, expiation. They're related, but hopefully it will make sense here in just a moment. He says, expiation is an action that has sin as its object. It denotes the covering putting away or rubbing out of sin so that no longer constitutes a barrier to friendly fellowship between man and God. Remember the goats, the one that was cast off? One was killed, sacrificed for 
our sin, took the punishment, and the other was cast off. That's expiation. He goes on to say propitiation, however, in the Bible denotes all that expiation means and the pacifying or satisfying of the wrath of God. You see why you need to know this word, propitiation? He propitiated. He took our sins. It was removed from us, placed on him, cast away forever. And he took all the punishment. It can never come back. There's no condemnation for us. He took it all. He propitiated, satisfied the wrath of God for you and for me for all time. Praise God. So on the cross, all of our sins were placed on him. He bore it all in his body on the tree such that in the eyes of God the Father, Jesus became as sin itself, sin personified. The sins of all of us were upon him. And in that moment, as the Father looked at that which was most abhorrent to him, sin, that which he hated most, and everything in him in his holiness and his justice was demanding his wrath be poured out in judgment on our sin. In that moment, disgusted by all that the sin on his own son, the father turned his face away as he poured out all of his wrath on Jesus. It was at this moment, theologians, as far as I know, all agree, on the cross, Jesus experienced something that you and I will never have to experience. This is one of those areas of suffering that we cannot follow him in. And we don't have to, praise God. We'll never know the depth of suffering Jesus experienced on the cross because on the cross, in that moment, as the Father turned away from his Son, he experienced the utter forsakenness of God. And because he did... You and I never will. It was at this moment that Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those should be our words. He spoke them in his humanity in that moment, what he was feeling. That he was experiencing and speaking out from what he was experiencing that we deserved right then. After he had fully satisfied the wrath of God, the last words Jesus is believed to have spoken on the cross was, It is finished. And the scripture says he believed it, breathed his last. He suffered for us and then he died for us. Friends, this, this is love. J.I. Packer, in this book that I referenced, one of the chapters, he tells a story of a legendary, I've never heard of him, but apparently legendary Rabbi Duncan. I don't think he's related at all to our bro, Stephen Duncan. This is Rabbi Duncan, who Packer says, in one of his classes, suddenly broke out in an outburst saying, do you know what Calvary was? What? 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 Then, with tears in his eyes, he proclaimed, Packer says, it was damnation. That's what Calvary was. It was the damnation that you and I deserve. And he took it. And as Rabbi Duncan says, he took it lovingly. In Romans 5, verse 8, Paul says, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, and later he adds enemies, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we were worthy or we were good. He died for us when we were the worst. We were his enemies. We were figuratively right there with the mob crying, crucify him. Friends, God chose us in Christ. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world. And we saved us by grace through faith in Christ alone. There's there's no other path. There's no other way to it. If you're here this morning, there, there is a way for you as well to experience 
what we, some of us here, have experienced, that our sins have been taken, the guilt has, is gone. We don't deserve it. We're no better than you or anybody else, but by the grace of God, He's opened our eyes to see what Jesus has done for us and to believe and trust in Him alone, that through His death and His shed blood, our sins have been paid and we are forgiven And God has declared and given to us, credited to us, the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's how we have right standing. That's the basis of our assurance that we have before God. And you could have that right now this morning by simply turning to Him. Turn away from your life of sin. We've all had to do this and look to Jesus. Believe on Him that He died for you and He rose from the dead. And you, the Scripture says, will be saved. We were foreloved by God because if He chose us for the foundation of the world to be in Christ, to be holy and blameless in His sight through Christ, and it's, it's the, the love of God being displayed. He loved us from before eternity began. And that's going to bring me to my last point, which will be shorter, but we're going to wind it up right here. His death has brought us new life. And we see in verse 24 that he died, Peter adds, that we might live essentially to righteousness. He says that he bore our sins, that firstly, that that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And in stating this, what Peter's doing, he has in mind our union with Christ, which is also by faith in his death and his resurrection from the dead. As we've been seeing, Jesus stood condemned in our place. He suffered in our place. He died in our place. And on the third day, the scriptures tell us, he rose from the dead victorious over sin and death and even the devil himself in our place. Peter is basically saying by implication what I believe Paul says explicitly in Romans 6. So one more text here by Paul we want to look at. We're not going to be able to unpack everything in this, but I want to read the whole section. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Just take, take all this in. What shall we say then, says Paul? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Sometimes we can feel like that. Well, our sin has been forgiven by grace through faith. It's all gone. There's no condemnation. It, we can be tempted to take sin less seriously. Paul says, by no means. How can we, he says, who died to sin still live in it? Though we might fall, Christians can fall in sin. We do not live in sin. How can we? How can we, who died to sin, live in it? Do you not know, he says, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. That's what baptism portrays. We just had a baptism recently. In order that, just as Christ was raised, he says, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know, he goes on, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin, our old nature, might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We, we're no longer in bondage to sin. Don't let the enemy fool you. It no longer has the dominion, the power of dominion over us. It's gone. It's been broken by Christ. We're no longer enslaved. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Yes, indeed. Because he died, we die. Because he raised, we too will rise. And even now, we already have newness of life to walk in. That's what this is all about, ultimately. That's why Peter brought this incredible foundational truth about the substitutionary atoning death of Christ who bore our sins on the cross so that, so that, he says, 
we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Not because we're so great and strong and powerful and we can do this. No, it's because of what Jesus, again, has already done and who we are now in Him. As new creations in Christ, we are free from the bondage of sin to live for Christ. And we're not needing in any way to earn our acceptance with God or forgiveness of sins. No, Jesus has taken care of all that. But because of who He is, what He's done to save us, who we are now in Him, therefore, we can live for Christ to righteousness as we were created in Him to live. We don't get there automatically. I wish we would. I wish the moment I said, yes, I believe in Jesus, and I trusted in Him, that suddenly all temptation fled from my being, and I began to live in perfect holiness. Uh, we're, none of us are there yet, but there is a promise of what's to come. One day we will be like Him. In the meantime, though, it, it is p- perfectly right that we're being called to live to righteousness, because that's what we were created in Christ for. He goes on in, in verse 24 to say, by his wound you've been healed, and then like sheep you've returned. Again, quoting both of these from Isaiah. Quoting from Isaiah 53, 5, he says uh, that the wounds of Christ, all of them, are for your healing, essentially. Now, this is often taken out of context to be some kind of name it, claim it verse. By his stripes, by his wounds, we've been healed. Therefore, I am not sick right now. As I'm wiping my nose, I'm not actually sick right now, but uh, hopefully get the point I'm making. When he's talking about our, by his wounds, we are healed, it's not, he's not speaking only of physical healing in this life, though God does heal. And, and we should pray for healing every time we're sick or someone we know is sick and, and believe that God can and, and often does miraculously heal people still. But what he has in mind here, rather, is the healing in the fullest sense of our souls, the ultimate sense from all consequences of sin, we have been healed. We have yet to come into the full reality of it. That will come when Jesus returns, but it's already true of us. Then, quoting from Isaiah 53, 6, Paul, Peter then reminds us that we are all once like stubborn sheep, straying, going our own way, and therefore without hope and without God in the world, destined only for judgment, destined for the wrath of God and eternal damnation. That's, what, that's the path we were on. But now, it's a very subtle but glorious but now here. But now he says, you have, we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. We have come, in essence, I would put it this way, into right relationship to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. By grace, through faith, in the substitutionary atoning, sacrificial atoning death of Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the cross. Maybe the worship group could come up to just share a a closing thought or two. Pulling all this together, I'd put it this way, that we are now foreigners and exiles in this world because we are no longer strangers and foreigners outcasts from God and from His presence. No, by grace we have returned We've been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We have returned, therefore, into right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And guess what? He will not lose his grip on us. He will not fail. The great shepherd who we have now come to, he will not fail to bring us all the way home and lead us all the way home to glory. We can bank on that more than anything else in this life. And with that in mind, therefore, let us offer up our entire soul, our entire being and life to Him as an offering of worship. Let us live for Christ and to righteousness for His sake. Amen?
Let's stand. Jesus, your mercy is on my plea. I have no defense. My guilt runs too deep. The best of my works pierced your hands and your feet. Jesus, your mercy is all my prayer. Jesus, your mercy is all my boast. The goodness I claim, the grounds of my home. Whatever I lack, it's still what I need more. Jesus, your mercy is all my boast. Praise the King who bore. My place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. Jesus, your mercy is all. Weigh me down and enemies press. A comfort I cling to in life and in death. Jesus, your mercy is all my rest. Praise the King who bore my sin, took my place. When I stood condemned, oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. Jesus, your mercy is all my joy. Forever I lift my heart and my voice To sing of a treasure no power can destroy Jesus, your mercy is all my joy Praise the King who bore my sin Took my place when I stood condemned, oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing, praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been. I will sing of your mercy. Sing that chorus one more time. Praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. You know, the temptation is to want to give you something to do. As I mentioned in the beginning, I, I, I really feel like what the Lord is saying, this is not about something to do this morning. This is about something He did. 
that we need to know at the deepest levels that we're capable of knowing anything. So I'm just going to just read the summary statement that I began with. This is what we get to know and live in the good of. Jesus Christ stood in our place to bear our sins, take the wrath we deserved so that we might live for him in his glory as God's holy people. He already did his part. We get to live it out now for him until he comes. Have a great afternoon, a great day. See you next week.